Section 13 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Influence of Magna Carta on American Constitutional Development by H. D. Hazeltine. Parts 2, 3, and 4. Part 2. By the close of the colonial period, principles of Magna Carta, adapted to social and political conditions in the American communities, had become firmly embedded in their systems of law and government. In the revolutionary epoch, extending from 1760 to 1783, these principles, as part of the whole body of English constitutional law claimed by the colonists as English subjects, were to enter upon a new phase of their American history. The years that immediately preceded the outbreak of war in 1775 and the Declaration of Independence in 1776 were characterized by a momentous controversy between the colonies and the mother country over constitutional principles. The doctrine that the colonists had all the rights of Englishmen had more and more strenuously asserted itself throughout the eighteenth century. At last the claims of the colonists were largely focused in the demand that there should be no taxation without representation, a principle which they held to be based on firm English foundations. As the controversy increased in intensity, the colonists appealed less to the guarantees of the royal charters, and more and more to the principles of the common law, especially the principles contained in Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and other documents of English liberty, in support of the views which they so strenuously asserted in opposition to the position taken up by Crown and Parliament. In the ten years just before the war, there was indeed a marked tendency evidenced by all the great state papers, such as the Massachusetts Circular Letter of 1768, the Virginia Resolutions of 1769, the Declaration and Resolves of the First Continental Congress of 1774, the Declaration of the Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms, 1775, and the Declaration of Independence, 1776, itself to base colonial rights on political and legal fundamentals to be found in the law of nature and the English Constitution. The colonists looked upon the English Constitution as their own, and revered it as the embodiment of their rights. The common rights of Englishmen formed the shield behind which they resisted what they held to be attempts upon their liberties. When the war at last came, it was fought out by the colonists in defense of what they held these rights to be, rights won in England in the long struggle for the rule of law, and embodied in the doctrines of common law, especially in the principles of Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and other English documents that visualized for the colonists their claims for freedom as opposed to tyranny. Thus it resulted that the controversy between England and her colonies, and the war that followed it, were largely caused by differences of opinion as to constitutional and legal questions, and that in the struggle of the colonists, for what they looked upon as their rights, Magna Carta, as one of the fundamentals, as part of the legal inheritance, the birthright of Englishmen at home and in the colonies, played a role of great prominence. Footnote. The American theory was summed up by Otis in one of the earliest, 1764, political pamphlets of the Revolution. Every British subject born on the continent of America is, by the laws of God and nature, by the common law, and by act of Parliament, entitled to all the natural, inherent, and inseparable rights of our fellow subjects in Great Britain. C. Channing, The United States of America, page 45. To what extent, if any, Magna Carta alone and of itself gave the colonists a basis for their version of the principle that there should be no taxation without representation, may be seen by a perusal of McKechnie, Magna Carta, 2nd edition, 1914, pages 231 to 240. 
End footnote. In considering the constitutional aspects of the revolutionary epoch, it should never be forgotten that since the early eighteenth century the institutions of England and of the colonies had been drifting apart, and that the colonists, unlike their kinsfolk in the mother country, did not recognize the doctrine of the supremacy of Parliament as an imperial legislature. In one highly important point, therefore, we find that the American Revolution was like the English Revolution of 1688. In England, powers of the king, asserted to be based on legitimate foundations, were destroyed. In America, powers of Parliament, unquestionably legal in character, were forcibly repudiated. Fundamental differences of opinion in regard to the authority of Parliament naturally affected the views of Englishmen at home and in the colonies as to the nature of constitutional rights and liberties and the interpretation to be placed upon constitutional documents such as the Great Charter and the Bill of Rights. Part 3 in respect of private law, the revolution resulted in no break with the past. After, as before the revolution, the common law, adapted and modified by its American environment, formed the general basis of private rights, and this feature of American law survives to the present day. So, too, in the matter of constitutional institutions, the revolution made less difference than is sometimes imagined, for in many of their main characteristics, the federal and state governments of the national era followed precedents of the colonial and revolutionary epochs. Thayer, in his essay on the American doctrine of constitutional law, sums up the revolution in two short sentences. The revolution came, and what happened then? Simply this, we cut the cord that tied us to Great Britain, and there was no longer an external sovereign that the federal and state constitutions contained vitally important features that were distinctively American as opposed to English is one of the commonplaces of political history. The institutional divergence from English models which set in, as we have already observed, during the early eighteenth century, was sure to produce ultimate results very different from some of the leading features of the English constitution. The federal nature of the Union, the sanctity of the written constitution as a document embodying the fundamental law, the coordination of the legislature, executive, and judicature as the three departments of government, which operate in distinct spheres and enjoy equality of position, the remarkable power of the judicature to declare an act of the legislature that conflicts with the written constitution null and void, these are four of the main characteristics which mark a wide gulf between American constitutional institutions and the unwritten constitution of England, under which Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights, although of fundamental significance, are yet subject, like any ordinary statute and the decisions of the courts, to the legislative sovereignty of Parliament. But in at least one highly important respect, the American constitutions display a striking adherence to the traditions of the English constitution. In the Bill of Rights, which forms a part of each of the written constitutions, both state and federal, there is a persistence of those fundamental rights of Englishmen embodied in Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights of 1689, and other leading sources of the common law. This whole development is summarized by Sir Frederick Pollock in one sentence of The Genius of the Common Law. Our fathers labored and strove chiefly in the field of crown law to work out those ideals of public law and liberty which are embodied in the Bill of Rights and are familiar to American citizens in the constitutions of the United States and of their several commonwealths. It is this American Bill of Rights, forming an important element in constitutional law, as distinct from constitutional institutions, which chiefly links the American constitutions of today with the Magna Carta of 1215. 1. As the direct descendants of the royal colonial charters, these charters being based on still earlier models, the state constitutions are the oldest feature of American political life. 
nearly all of the original thirteen colonies, when they declared their independence and framed their state constitutions, included in these documents, as perhaps their most important feature, a declaration of the fundamental rights and liberties of man. Most of the clauses of this declaration, known collectively as the Bill of Rights, were taken over from colonial and revolutionary laws and constitutional documents, the contents of which, in turn, as we have already seen, had been derived originally, in important particulars, from Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and other great constitutional statutes which secured the liberties of Englishmen. As new states have been admitted into the Union from time to time, they too have embodied a Bill of Rights in their constitutions. In this way, therefore, the Bill of Rights of the state constitutions traces its pedigree back to Magna Carta. In each separate state of the Federal Republic, as in England, the Great Charter of 1215 still exists, protecting men in their lives, liberties, and estates from the encroachments of arbitrary or tyrannical government. Footnote. Bryce, American Commonwealth, 1910, Volume 1, pages 426 to 463, gives a summary account of state constitutions and their history. On page 438, he says, The Bill of Rights is historically the most interesting part of these state constitutions, for it is the legitimate child and representative of Magna Carta, and of those other declarations and enactments, down to the Bill of Rights of the Act of One William and Mary, Session Two, by which the liberties of Englishmen have been secured. End footnote. Naturally, the state constitutions vary in the form of words chosen to express the rights and liberties derived from Magna Carta. Some constitutions, more especially perhaps the earlier ones, follow the original model closely. Others are couched in terms more suited to American conditions. But the main features of the original are in all cases retained in the American derivations. So, too, the constitutions vary one from the other in the extent to which they borrow from the Great Charter. Some take more and some less. But in all are to be found, in one phrasing or another, the essence of Chapter 39. Thus, to cite only one illustration, in Section 16 of the Constitution of the New State of Oklahoma, 1907, Chapter 39 of Magna Carta appears in the phrasing, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. 2. The Federal Constitution of 1789, including the amendments of 1791 and of later times, is likewise derived in part from the colonial charters and from other constitutional and legal sources of the colonies and of England. In Lord Bryce's felicitous words, the American Constitution is no exception to the rule that everything which has power to win the obedience and respect of men must have its roots deep in the past, and that the more slowly every institution has grown, so much the more enduring is it likely to prove. There is little in this Constitution that is absolutely new. There is much that is as old as Magna Carta. The Constitution of 1789 embodies, in one article or another, various declarations of the fundamental rights of men. Thus, for example, it provides for taxation by the legislature only, for the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, for trial by jury in criminal cases, for the prohibition of bills of attainder, ex post facto laws, laws impairing the obligation of contracts, and laws imposing religious tests. These and other provisions, derived in large measure from English and colonial precedents, constitute a body of constitutional guarantees of the highest value. But the absence of a formal Bill of Rights, similar to the one included in state constitutions, was at once severely criticized by the people as a feature of the Constitution dangerous to their liberties. Footnote. Some of the leading statesmen held that same view. Thus Jefferson said, 
I hope that a declaration of rights will be drawn up to protect the people against the federal government, as they are already protected in most cases against the state governments. Jefferson seems to have had in mind the Bill of Rights embodied in state constitutions. End footnote. In response to persistent demands, ten amendments, taking effect in 1791, were added to the original instrument. These first ten amendments, which are to be viewed as a supplement or postscript to the original Constitution, and not as an alteration of it, make up what is called, after the English and earlier American precedents, the Declaration or Bill of Rights. In essence, this Bill of Rights secures the rights and liberties of the individual citizens and the separate states against the encroachments of the federal government. Although each of the amendments added to the Constitution after 1791 demands separate consideration, both in respect to its general scope and the place it holds in the whole body of the Constitution, yet we may regard the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, in certain of their fundamental characteristics, as later additions to the Bill of Rights contained in the first ten amendments. It is said that the people regarded the liberties embodied in the first ten amendments as their own because they were based on old English law. Certainly a study of the amendments reveals the fact that the origin of some of their features is to be traced to the common and statutory law of England. Certain of their clauses are undoubtedly based directly or indirectly, through colonial and revolutionary precedents, upon Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and other English constitutional documents. Thus, upon Magna Carta rests the provision in the Fifth Amendment that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Similarly, the Fourteenth Amendment, 1868, in declaring that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, adopts, like the Fifth Amendment, the thirty-ninth chapter of Magna Carta. The last clause of the First Amendment, which provides that Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people to petition the government for a redress of grievances, seems to go back for its origin through various American documents to the English Bill of Rights. So, also, upon the English Bill of Rights is based the Second Amendment, which declares that a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In the words of Judge Cooley, the amendment, like most other provisions in the Constitution, has a history. It was adopted with some modification and enlargement from the English Bill of Rights, where it stood as a protest against arbitrary action of the overturned dynasty in disarming the people, and as a pledge of the new rulers that this tyrannical action should cease. Again, the Eighth Amendment is almost an exact transcript of the clause in the English Bill of Rights, which provides that excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. The Eighth Amendment reads, Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. These and other provisions in the Federal Constitution rest upon the constitutional law of England. Magna Carta's contribution to the Federal instrument and to the State Constitutions consists fundamentally in the adaptation of the famous Chapter 39 to meet American conditions. This chapter had been embodied in colonial law. By its incorporation in state constitutions and in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments to the Federal Constitution, it still serves as the basis of the rule of law throughout the Republic. 3. Legal and historical accuracy may well be placed in jeopardy by considering the due process of law clauses apart from their full setting in the amendments and in the whole scheme of fundamental law as set forth in the complete federal instrument. But with this caution, a few words in explanation of the meaning and scope of the clauses may be ventured. The last words of the Fifth Amendment, 1791, 
declare that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The last portion of Section 1 of the Fourteenth Amendment, 1868, reads, No State shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any State deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. American political and constitutional history of absorbing interest and moment surrounds every word of these due process of law clauses. Suffice it here to say that the prohibition of the Fifth Amendment was introduced as a check upon the federal government, as distinct from the state governments, while in the Fourteenth Amendment, adopted after the great civil war between the North and the South, the prohibition is directed against the individual states that compose the Union. Thus the two amendments, under the dual government inseparably incident to American federalism, supplement one the other. Together the amendments ensure to the people their individual rights to life, liberty, and property under the rule of law, as opposed to arbitrary and tyrannical action on the part of either state or federal governments. The Due Process of Law Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment represents, therefore, the latest obligation of America to Magna Carta. Indeed, as Judge Dillon, in commenting on the constitutional guarantees of the two amendments, remarks, this was not new language, or language of uncertain meaning. It was taken purposely from Magna Carta. It was language not only memorable in its origin, but it had stood for more than five centuries as the classic expression and the recognized bulwark of the ancient and inherited rights of Englishmen to be secure in their personal liberty and in their possessions. It was, moreover, language which shone resplendent with the light of universal justice, and for these reasons it was selected to be put into the Fifth Amendment of the Federal Constitution as it had already been put into the charters and constitutions of the several states. It was of set purpose that the prohibitions of the Fourteenth Amendment were directed to any and every form and mode of state action as opposed to federal action, whether in the shape of constitutions, statutes, or judicial judgments that deprived any person, white or black, natural or corporate, of life, liberty, or property, or of the equal protection of the laws. Its value consists in the great fundamental principles of right and justice, which it embodies and makes part of the organic law of the nation. It will hereafter, more fully than at present, be regarded as the American complement of the Great Charter, and be to America, as the Great Charter was and is to England, the source of perennial blessings. Footnote Adams, Origin of the English Constitution, 1912, page 243, in commenting on Chapter 39 of Magna Carta, remarks, What was then, 1215, demanded, was a trial according to law, and securing to them, the barons, their legal rights. Taken in this sense, Clause 39 of Magna Carta would correspond somewhat closely to the general prohibition included in Amendment 14 to the Constitution of the United States. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. End footnote. The Supreme Court of the United States has never attempted to give a rigid and complete definition of due process of law. The policy of the court has been expressed in the recent case of Twining v. New Jersey. This court has always declined to give a comprehensive definition of it, and has preferred that its full meaning should be gradually ascertained by the process of inclusion and exclusion in the course of the decisions of cases as they arise. There are certain general principles well settled, however, which narrow the field of discussion, and may serve as helps to correct conclusions. These principles grow out of the proposition universally accepted by American courts on the authority of Coke, 
that the words due process of law are equivalent in meaning to the words law of the land contained in that chapter of magna carta which provides that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or outlawed or exiled or in any wise destroyed nor shall we go upon him nor send upon him but by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land in hagar v reclamation district the court had already expressed the view that the meaning of due process of law is that there can be no proceeding against life liberty or property which may result in deprivation of either without the observance of those general rules established in our system of jurisprudence for the security of private rights so too in bank of columbia v oakley it was said as to the words from magna carta after volumes spoken and written with a view to their exposition the good sense of mankind has at length settled down to this that they were intended to secure the individual from the arbitrary exercise of the powers of government unrestrained by the established principles of private right and distributive justice although the due process of law phrase is thus historically derived from and closely related to the phrase per legem terre of magna carta nevertheless in the application of the clause to the institutions of government in the two countries there is a marked difference between the constitution of england and that of america in england the provisions of magna carta including chapter thirty nine were originally intended and have since been regarded as a limitation upon the executive and judicature not upon the legislature in english law chapter thirty nine is held to mean that no person is subject to the arbitrary acts of the crown or its courts that no person shall be deprived of his life liberty or property unless in accordance with the existing law of the land whether it be common law or statutory law parliament is not affected by the limitations imposed on the crown and the courts legally the parliament is the sovereign power and can at any moment alter the law of the land by its enactments the rights of the individual are in theory and in practice subject to the supreme legislative power of parliament as this legislative supremacy of parliament was fully established by the time of the adoption of the fifth and fourteenth amendments it might be contended that historically their due process of law clauses were not intended to operate as a limitation upon the powers of the state legislatures and of the federal congress but american constitutional government both state and federal is based on written instruments which in the sphere of political and legal activity are fundamental and supreme though subject of course to the principle that they may be amended by the people acting through the machinery which the constitutions themselves provide in vital differences between the english unwritten constitution and the american written constitutions we must seek for the explanation of certain features of american divergence from english precedents in result the general purpose of written constitutions in america has gradually come to be entirely different from the purpose of magna carta and the other great constitutional documents of england in america to employ willoughby's careful analysis written instruments of government and their accompanying bills of rights have for their aim the delimitation of the powers of all the departments of government the legislative as well as the executive and judicial and it is therefore quite proper to hold that the requirement of due process of law should not only prohibit executive and judicial officers from proceeding against the individual except in conformity with procedural requirements but also operate to nullify legislative acts which provide for the taking of private property without compensation or life and liberty without cause or in general for executive or judicial action against the individual of an arbitrary or clearly unjust and oppressive character by a long and careful process of judicial construction the prohibitions of the due process of law clauses 
have thus come to be applied to all three departments of the state and federal governments, the legislative no less than the executive and judicial. The Supreme Court of the United States, in the leading case of Hurtado v. California, decided in 1884, emphasizes the fundamental distinction between the constitutional doctrines of England and of America, and shows that the provision of Magna Carta has been incorporated into American constitutional law, but incorporated in a way which brings it into harmony with American notions, not only of the supremacy of the written constitution, and of the coordination of the three departments of government under that constitution, but of the great power entrusted to the courts of declaring legislative acts which conflict with the constitution null and void. In this case, the courts say, the concessions of Magna Carta were wrung from the king as guarantees against the oppressions and usurpations of his prerogative. It did not enter into the minds of the barons to provide security against their own body, or in favor of the commons, by limiting the power of Parliament, so that bills of attainder, ex post facto laws, laws declaring forfeitures of estates, and other arbitrary acts of legislation, which occur so frequently in English history, were never regarded as inconsistent with the law of the land. For notwithstanding what was attributed to Lord Coke in Bonham's case, the omnipotence of Parliament over the common law was absolute, even against common right and reason, the actual and practical security for English liberty against legislative tyranny was the power of a free public opinion represented by the commons. In this country, written constitutions were deemed essential to protect the rights and liberties of the people against the encroachments of power delegated to their governments, and the provisions of Magna Carta were incorporated into bills of rights. They were limitations upon all the powers of government, legislative as well as executive and judicial. Applied in England only as guards against executive usurpation and tyranny, here they have become bulwarks also against arbitrary legislation. But in that application, as it would be incongruous to measure and restrict them to the ancient customary English law, they must be held to guarantee not particular forms of procedure, but the very substance of individual rights of life, liberty, and property. Part 4. The history of Magna Carta in America has a meaning far deeper than the influence of a single constitutional document, for Magna Carta typifies those ideals of law and government which have spread to America and to many other political communities that lie beyond the four seas encircling the island realm itself. The worldwide diffusion of those ideals of liberty and justice deserves to be studied in its entirety, as a vast historical process which had its beginnings far back in the Middle Ages, and which has shaped and is still shaping in modern times the institutions of all the political commonwealths that owe their spiritual inheritance to England. The history of the Charter's influence upon American constitutional development, as one phase of that vaster process, should be illuminating alike to subjects of the Crown and citizens of the Republic. Above all, it teaches them that English political and legal ideals lie at the basis of much that is best in American institutions. Those ideals, jealously preserved and guarded by Americans throughout their whole history, still form the vital force in political thought and activity within the Union. As the Americans adapt their institutions to the ever-changing conditions of national and international life, those ideals of liberty and justice, founded upon the Great Charter, will continue to inspire and guide them. The Charter has a future as well as a past in the American Commonwealth, for its spirit is inherent in the aspirations of the race. End of Section 13